The uh, subcommittee will come to order. Uh, the chair would uh, introduce now the second panel of witnesses. Um, first, Mr. John Michael Loftus. Mr. Loftus is testifying today on behalf of the families of Continental Flight 3407. Uh, he's a farmer pilot with Continental Airlines, and of course his daughter Madeline, as I mentioned earlier, was on flight 3407. Um, Mr. Loftus, again, uh, we offer our condolences to you and to the other family members who are here. We appreciate the fact that uh, you're willing to testify and to give your perspective uh, before our subcommittee. Next, Mr. Uh, John Prater, Captain John Prater, who's the president of the Airline Pilots Association International. Mr. Roger Cohen, president of the Regional Airline Association. Mr. Daniel Morgan, who's the vice president, safety and regulatory compliance with Colgan Air. Mr. James May, president and CEO of the Air Transport Association. Dr. R. Curtis Graber, uh, fellow who's uh, flight uh, safety with the Flight Safety Foundation, and Dr. Frank Ayers, Chairman of the Flight Training Department, Professor of Aeronautical Science at Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical University. Um, gentlemen, thank you all for being here today to testify before the subcommittee. Uh, let me uh, say that your entire uh, written statements, your testimony will be submitted in the record, and we would ask you to summarize your testimony so that uh, we have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, at this time, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Loftus. Uh, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak before your uh, subcommittee today. My name is John Michael Loftus. I am here today on behalf of the families of Continental Flight 3407, both as a father and as a former pilot with Continental and Continental Express for over 20 years. My daughter Maddie was on board Flight Continental, Flight 3407, on February 12th, 2009. Maddie was a beautiful 24-year-old woman just starting down the pathway of her adult life. She had just finished her education and had returned to New Jersey to home to where she had landed an excellent job in an outstanding pharmaceutical aid advertising agency. She was surrounded by family and friends who loved her. As she boarded Flight 3407, she was so excited about going back to Buffalo State College to, for an alumni hockey game. So excited to see her old teammates and friends and to pursue one of the loves of her life, hockey. In other words, she was poised to begin the rest of her life. But that night, on board Flight 3407, all her hopes and dreams and plans for the future, career, love, marriage, motherhood, were brutally extinguished. And we are left here sitting today asking why. I don't think we can ever make sense of the tragic loss of Maddie and the other 49 people on board that flight last night, that night. But we can, we must do everything in our power to ensure that it never happens again. I speak to you not only as a grieving parent, but I also bring my aviation background, uh, having been a commercial pilot for 26 years and 22 years of flying experience with Continental and Continental Express. If I could leave you members with uh, two things, two thoughts today, they would be, there is no substitute for experience in the air and the importance of pilot training especially in emergency circumstances, cannot be overstated. My experience in the cockpit involved many difficult flying conditions. I flew into thunderstorms, low ceiling, dense fog, and many winter seasons involving icing conditions. The key to my success was being able to gain the knowledge by flying with other, more experienced pilots who had dealt with these same difficult flying con conditions longer than I. When I flew for Continental Express as a regional pilot, I had the benefit of having access to the same training and pilot resources that the pilots at Continental, our major carrier, had. However, as the third tier of regional airlines sprung up, I saw the industry devolving into two levels of safety, one for the majors and a second for the regionals. Small regional carriers like Colgan Air have less resources for training. Pilots could not benefit from the existing training department, the extensive training department, with decades of, of uh, institutional knowledge. These are just a few of the insights that I've gathered during my years as a commercial pilot uh, that relate to some of the safety issues that have been exposed uh, by the tragedy of Flight 3407. More important than just identifying the problems, however, our, fam our family members implore you to push for solutions. First, 
we need to take an industry-wide look at the experience requirements in terms of hiring, upgrading, and the pairing of pilots together in the cockpit. In the case of Flight 3407, the fact that the pilot had failed check rides in 2006 and 2007 while at Coven, and yet still was upgraded to captain in 2008, and was paired with a young first officer who was uncomfortable with her icing training, reflected the improvements need to be made in this area. Second, we need to revamp the approach to training. More importantly, the difference of not just what is trained, but how it's trained. That is where the wide gap exists between the majors and the regionals. Regional pilots typically have less experience, fly more legs in a day, and often face more difficult low altitude weather conditions. And yet they receive, they, they are not receiving the high level of training their counterparts receive at the major carriers. So what, is, so what we need is for the major carriers to play a more hands-on role in the design, execution, and oversight of the training programs utilized by the regional partners. When our loved ones bought tickets under the continental name, that is what they were entitled to. Finally, we need to require, not just recommend, that all the regional carriers implement best practice safety initiatives that are commonplace among today's carriers, major carriers, FOQA, LOSA, and ASAP. There is no reason for the state-of-the-art state of the art safety tools not to be made available to the regional pilots. Unfortunately, as a veteran of the industry, I have often heard it is said that most aviation regulations and procedures are written in blood. My Maddie and 49 other people who died that tragic night in February have given their blood, and now, they, now we believe they are owed solutions. We are asking you to invest time, effort, and resources to make the necessary changes in the airline industry. You are the only ones who can bring together all the stakeholders, the regionals, the majors, the unions, the manufacturers, the FAA, and the interests of the fine public. You alone can marshal the forces of the government to ensure we achieve one level of safety that all Americans deserve. Although some of the voices in the industry may complain about the economic cost of safety improvements, we are here to tell you that no price tag can match the price that we have paid with the loss of our loved ones. It is our responsibility to ensure that no other Americans will have to pay this price in the future. When you are faced with the tough decisions, please think of your daughter, son, or loved one flying on a turboprop airplane, the last flight of the night in the dead of winter in Minnesota, Illinois, Wisconsin, upstate New York, and please ask yourself, how much is their life worth? I miss my daughter every day. Her mother, brother, sister, and miss her terribly too. My wish is not to have to see another father, mother, husband, wife, or child sitting before this committee asking the same questions. Let's join together and commit to solve these problems and these issues now. Thank you. Mr. Loftus, thank you. Uh, Captain Prayer. Thank you. Uh Chairman Costello, good afternoon uh, to the committee. As Captain Loftus and I go back over 20 years, as Congresswoman Schmidt recognized, accidents are personal, and they are personal to those of us who fly the airplanes. I, too, knew Maddie as she tried to teach me how to ice skate. We commend this committee for calling this hearing and looking at the importance of these vital issues. And we look forward to participating with the FAA in their call to action summit next week to address the issues in much more depth. While this summit is a good start, these issues are complex and long-term solutions need to be identified. And we encourage the continued attention and participation of this committee. In recent years, the major airlines have come to rely heavily on code share arrangements with so-called regional airlines to connect large, mid-sized, and small cities in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico to their international hubs. This has resulted in the exponential growth of the regional sector of the industry. Still, the major carriers exert a great deal, total economic pressure on the regional airlines to provide their service at the lowest possible price. They control ticket pricing and schedules and regularly move flying between their regional partners. Some major airlines have even begun outsourcing their flying to regionals and laying off their own pilots, losing decades of experience in the process. 
These experienced pilots cannot afford to work for one of these so-called regional carriers as a newly hired first officer. As a result, many of the smaller regional carriers hire pilots at the FAA minimum standards and do not employ adequate screening processes during hiring that identify that ideal candidate. As was brought out during the NTSB's recent hearing on the tragic accident in Buffalo, many pilots who fly for regional airlines are not getting adequate training or enough rest. Airlines are requiring pilots to work longer days and more of them each month. Fleet and base changes are forcing pilots to, to decide between commuting or possibly taking a huge pay cut to train on new equipment. The consequences, the quality of airline pilot careers has been greatly diminished, and the severe erosion of benefits and quality of life are motivating the experienced pilots to move to other professions. Current training practices do not take into account the drastic change in pilot applicants' experience. Instead, they assume that pilots are far more experienced than they may actually be. ALPA believes there must be a new focus on standardization and even on some fundamental flying skills. To meet this challenge, airlines and other training providers must develop methodologies to train for that lack of experience and to train for judgment. Current training practices may also need to be adjusted to account for the source and experience level of that new pilot entering into initial training at his or her airline. ALPA also believes there should be more stringent academic requirements to obtain both commercial and airline transport pilot ratings in preparation to start a career as an airline pilot. The FAA should develop and implement a structured and rigorous ground school and testing procedures for pilots who want to qualify to fly for Part 121 airlines. ALPA also recommends that airlines provide specific command and leadership training courses for new captains to instill in them the necessary skills and traits to become a real leader on the flight deck. Airlines should also implement mentoring programs for both captains and first officers as they first enter operations in their new crew positions to help them apply the knowledge and skills to line operations and to supplement their own limited experience by learning from their experienced peers. Flight experience and pilot capabilities cannot be measured by mere flight hours. Screening processes should be established prior to initial pilot hiring to ensure that new hire airline pilots are indeed the best and brightest as far as abilities, airmanship, professionalism, and performance. Turning to another area of concern, this committee has listened to me and my predecessors since 1990 on pilot fatigue. I won't mention anything longer except to say we've talked long enough. It's time to implement science-based regulatory changes. Other means to enhance safety and improve airline operations are the data collection and analysis programs such as FOC1 ASAP, share that information across the industry, and then modify and take, take indeed the best practices and implement them. In order to allow these programs to grow and make the reports more readily obtainable, we will need additional legislative protections to be put into place that will limit the use of ASAP and FOC1 data <laughs> in civil liability cases. Restrictions need to be strengthened that the ins to ensure the data is used for safety purposes only. I'll close with many major carriers have implemented these type of programs. We want them to spread and be protected. The best safety device on any airplane is a well-trained, well-rested, highly motivated pilot. A strong safety culture must be instilled and consistently re reinforced from the highest levels within an airline and among its code share partners. This type of organizational safety culture will encourage the highest levels of performance among professional pilots, improve airline operations, and most importantly, advance aviation safety so we're not back here again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Prater. The chair now recognizes Mr. Cohen. I don't think the microphone's on. Yeah. I'm Roger Cohen, and I'm president of the Regional Airline Association. And I want to express our deepest sympathies for the lives of the passengers and the crew of Flight 3407 that were lost and for their families affected by the crash and that we share in their grief. 
I also want to express, not only for our member airlines, but for the 60,000 highly trained professionals in our industry, our total and unwavering commitment to safety and to work towards ensuring that this post-accident process does not have to be repeated, ever. To take whatever steps are necessary to, to make certain that our flight crews and our airplanes are as safe as humanly possible. The safety of the nation's skies is a shared responsibility, and our challenge for the Federal Aviation Safety Agencies, for the airlines, for our employees, is to review all of the issues with but one single objective, and that's to prevent any future accidents. And as we do that, it is important to keep our perspective, to reassure the American public that flying is extremely safe. In fact, until this recent tragedy, commercial airlines had gone the longest period in aviation history without a fatal accident. Working collectively, airlines have steadily improved our safety record over the course of many decades of safety initiatives, investigations, and reviews of accidents and incidents, large and small. Nevertheless, we can do better. And our industry's overarching goal has been and always will be zero accidents and zero fatalities. Mr. Chairman, today we want to better define today's regional airlines to clear up any misconceptions. But more importantly, we would like to talk about the steps regional airlines have already taken and the actions we plan to take to further intensify this commitment to safety and accident prevention. <clears throat> As has been described, our airplanes typically carry up to 100 passengers. More than 50 percent of the scheduled flights in the United States are on regional airlines, and most notably, Three out of every four communities in this country with scheduled service are served exclusively by regional airlines. Our airlines largely operate in seamless partnership with the major airlines. Regional airlines provide the crew and the aircraft, while major airlines set the flight schedules, the fares, and the customer service standards. Regional airlines and their major airline partners operate as a single integrated system. One ticket, one trip, one safety standard. All passenger airlines are subject to the exact same FAA safety standards and requirements. It's been this way for more than a decade. But our goal is to prevent accidents. And that's why the Regional Airline Association has embarked upon our strategic safety initiative to underscore our safety culture and to help prevent accidents. And this strategic safety initiative has four elements. First, we are bringing together our own safety professionals to review all of the procedures and address any issue that could even be perceived, perceived as a contributing factor to an accident. Second, we're going to conduct a thorough review of fatigue, looking at all the human factors that have been described today in the scientific field to minimize risks associated with fatigue. Third, RAA will implement a fatigue awareness management program so that our airlines keep this issue at the top of the mind for both their flight crews and, just as importantly, airline management. The last element is reaching out in partnership with you and Congress across the government and to our fellow stakeholders in labor and throughout the aviation industry to explore the full range of issues which could help us improve safety and prevent future accidents. And among those are, it's been noted, establishing a single integrated FAA database of pilot records, exploring random fatigue testing, a full examination of commuting, extending the period for background checks from five to ten years, analyzing the information from cockpit voice recorders in settings other than accident investigations, and mining this great field of checkride data for trends. We've already begun implementing this initiative, and we look forward to working with this subcommittee in 
keep you informed throughout the process. Mr. Chairman, thank you and be glad to answer any questions you might have. Chair, thank you. Mr. Cohen and now recognizes uh, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Chairman, committee members, I would first like to take this opportunity to express the condolences from all of us at Colgan Air to the families of those who were lost in the tragedy of Flight 3407. We know your grief, and I assure you that we all have a common goal to prevent such catastrophes from ever happening again. The nature of flying airplanes entails risk, and it's the job of all professionals in the airline industry to reduce that risk <coughs> to an absolute minimum. As such, this process today is vital to that mission. Mr. Chairman, every aviation accident teaches us something more about how to prevent another tragedy. We all learn from our experiences, and as a result, we constantly improve our industry. Those of us who have long been part of this industry, whether from the airlines, FAA, NTSB, or other regulatory entities, and particularly those of us from the safety departments of the business, are always saddened by the loss of any airplane from any airline anywhere in the world. But we also know that what we learn from each event will make us stronger, and indeed it has. In my 30 years as an airline professional, I've seen the U.S. airline industry endure some remarkable challenges in a constantly changing environment. Our business is incredibly complex. The aircraft, the air traffic systems, the intricacies of regulations all make this a demanding industry. But the men and women I have had the privilege to work with in my career have continuously stepped up to the challenges. And because of what we have learned, we have made the U.S. commercial airline system the absolute best in the world. I have no doubt that the next generation of airline professionals will continue to face this inexorable challenge of change. I believe it is my job, as well as the job of all of us in this business, to use our experience, the knowledge we have gained in our careers, to hand that next generation a safer product, and in so doing, leave a safer industry for the public to enjoy. And that's why I'm here with you today, to defer the legacy of air travel, safe air travel. I appreciate the opportunity to come before this committee today and continue the process of furthering aviation safety. I have also provided additional remarks and information in my submitted testimony, and I'm prepared to address your questions and concerns. Chair, thanks you, and uh, now recognizes Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning or afternoon. Let me begin by saying that the crash of Colgan Air aircraft near Buffalo was a tragedy, and it has produced uh, indescribable heartache for the relatives and friends of victims of that uh, accident. I have personally expressed my condolences to Captain Loftus, and I do so for the rest of the families. In the airline industry, safety is our highest priority. We work closely with all members of the aviation community to achieve high levels of safety, including regional airlines. It is in that spirit that I appear before you this morning. No accident, as you've heard others say, is acceptable. We have a responsibility to understand through rigorous and searching inquiry the cause of the Buffalo accident and to take whatever corrective measures are needed. In light of that responsibility, we're very fortunate that there are three expert government forums in which that scrutiny is happening. This is as it should be. The public needs to be confident in our responses to aviation safety issues. The National Transportation Safety Board's ongoing investigation will produce a far more complete picture than we have today of what so tragically unfolded that evening. In this, as in previous accidents, the board is the authoritative source for making that determination and recommending corrective actions. In addition, the Department of Transportation's Inspector General recently began an assessment of the FAA's oversight of certification, pilot qualification, training, and other issues. When that review was announced, we, ATA, immediately offered our resources in full cooperation to the IG. I have met with uh, IG Scoville and his team, and we will do so again. His evaluation and the constructive suggestions that we know will result from it will augment the NTSB's effort. Finally, next Monday's FAA-sponsored call to action meeting is an immediate, broad-based forum to look at safety issues, including those raised at this morning's hearing. ATA was a major participant in the runway safety call to action held by the FAA two years ago that advanced runway safety through the well-informed assessments and concrete recommendations of the participants. We look forward to being equally engaged with the FAA and other interested stakeholders 
in the vital work that will begin next Monday, and I think it's actually Tuesday. Although we won't have the results of the NTSB's investigation and the IG review for some time, we do expect similar positive results. Now, I don't believe that any topic, any topic, should be off the table at the call to action meeting. We need to have a full and frank conversation about safety. So let me suggest seven subjects that for openers should be considered. First, mandatorily applying the FOQA flight operational quality assurance programs used by major carriers to regional airlines. FOQA works, the collection and analysis of data recorded during flight safety, during flight improves safety. Second, applying Aviation Safety Action Program, ASAP, which encourages voluntary reporting of safety issues and events that come to the attention of employees to those regional airlines that do not have such a program already. Third, identifying advanced training best practices of major carriers for use by regional airlines, like AQP for training. Fourth, as has been said by others today, we need to have a centralized database of pilot records to help airlines evaluate the backgrounds of applicants for flight deck positions. We think that the FAA should determine if such a system can be efficiently, effectively implemented. Fifth, the issue of compliance with the sterile cockpit rule has been raised. Let's see if FAA needs to increase compliance oversight in this area. Sixth. Let's examine flight crew preparedness. In particular, we should look at what crew members have done before they've reported to work that may affect their performance in the cockpit. And seventh, let's also examine crew member commuting and whether it requires additional attention. Mr. Chairman, we are committed to working with the stakeholders to develop solutions to any safety issues, including those that emerge from these three important governmental initiatives. Thank you. Chair, thanks you, and now uh, recognizes Dr. Graber. Chairman, Chairman Costello, Ranking Member Petri, and distinguished sub members of the subcommittee. My name is Curtis Graber. I'm a fellow of the Flight Safety Foundation and a former NASA scientist. The foundation is an international organization dedicated to the continuous improvement of global aviation safety, and we appreciate this opportunity to testify about recent scientific progress related to flight crew fatigue. Unfortunately, fatigue is ubiquitous and unavoidable in aviation. To address it, regulators have traditionally imposed limits governing how long and how often pilots can operate an airplane. Different countries impose different limits, usually based on very little scientific knowledge. The FAA's flight time limitations are no different and have remained essentially unchanged for 50 years. Several attempts have failed to update the regulations. However, such efforts would likely result in little improvement because there are really attempts to tweak what already exists. More effective tools are needed. Fortunately, over the past three decades, there has been an extensive scientific effort to better understand the complex origins of fatigue, its impact on performance, and how to mitigate its risk. In 1980, the Congress directed NASA to undertake a multi-year effort to improve our understanding of crew fatigue and jet lag. The results of this work as well as other non-aviation studies, can now provide the scientific basis for a paradigm shift in how we manage fatigue risk. This shift is known as fatigue risk management, a systematic approach to addressing fatigue in a comprehensive, proactive manner that does not rely solely on adherence to a set of prescribed hourly limits. In its broadest form, fatigue risk management takes a systematic, three-pronged approach incrementally to manage fatigue risk, prevention, mitigation, and intervention. The first step, prevention, can be characterized as strategic risk prevention. It includes such measures as scientifically defensible scheduling and education about sleep and fatigue. We believe that this step should also include medical identification and treatment of sleep disorders. However, the FAA's medical examination has no requirement to identify them in pilots. It should. The second step encompasses risk mitigation at the operational level. The final step, intervention, recognizes the inevitable fact that crews sometimes experience significant fatigue despite the best efforts to prevent it. It may include interventions such as controlled rest on the flight deck. A key part of the initial prevention step involves the alternative use of a fatigue risk management system, or FRMS, in place of prescribed flight duty limits to limit what is scientifically defensible schedule. It takes into account known variables that affect sleep and alertness, but which prescriptive flight duty limits cannot address. 
In contrast to prescriptive limits, an FRMS employs a multi-layered data-driven defense to manage operational, operational fatigue risk proactively. Objective and subjective data related to crew alertness, as well as FOQA data, are routinely collected and analyzed to monitor where fatigue risk occurs and where safety may be jeopardized. The system then allows for generating new scheduling solutions or other strategies to mitigate measured fatigue risk. At the same time, FRMS provides operators with flexibility to seek the most efficient, safe crewing solutions to meet operational needs. In early 2006, ICAO established a subgroup to develop an international regulatory framework for fatigue risk management. Their starting point was the model developed by the Flight Safety Foundation for ultra-long-range operations beyond 16 hours. ICAO's draft framework recommends incorporating FRMS into an operator's proactive and accountable SMS. The Flight Safety Foundation strongly encourages the industry to adopt a proactive approach of prevention, mitigation, and intervention to systematically address fatigue risk management. The United States aviation community can no longer treat fatigue risk as just another rule that has to be met. We congratulate the FAA for sponsoring a major international symposium on aviation fatigue management last June. Several non-U.S. airlines reported on their successful implementation of FRMS that has resulted in enhanced safety, improved crew satisfaction, greater operational flexibility, lower costs, including insurance premiums. The Foundation also believes that controlled rest on the flight deck should be made legal for use when necessary for the safety of flight. Its effectiveness was demonstrated dramatically by NASA in 1989 and incorporated into a draft advisory circular in 1993 yet it has never been implemented in the United States. Numerous authorities around the world have approved it, <coughs> been successfully used by foreign carriers since 1994, and frankly, the oft-repeated excuse that it doesn't pass the Jay Leno test isn't valid anymore. Finally, the Foundation urges the FAA to further develop and implement fatigue risk management on a trial basis, as it is already doing for ultra-long-range flights from the U.S. to Mumbai and Hong Kong. Together, these actions will enable U.S. commercial aviation to enhance its level of safety with regard to fatigue risk and do so efficiently and proactively. The Foundation believes that the United States should be leading the world in fatigue risk management instead of following. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gravers, and the Chair now recognizes uh, Dr. Ayers. Chairman Costello, Ranking Member Petrie, uh, Chairman Oberstar, Committee Members. Uh, my name is Frank Ayers, and I have the privilege of uh, uh, managing the training for all the pilots at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida, who are moving on to the regional and the major airlines. As you may be aware, Embry-Riddle was founded as a flight training school in 1926, in fact, well before many of the major airlines and the uh, regional airlines. And the intervening 83 years, while we have expanded to become a major engineering business and aviation university, uh, our core uh, uh, capability has always been in producing the best pilots available in the industry. Um, as I listened to uh, Captain Prater's comments about what a training organization should be, uh, I reflected back on what I see every day at Embry-Riddle, and I think it might inform the discussion of how training is done for young people who move from off the street into regional airline cockpits. Uh, first, the program at Embry-Riddle uh, has high selection standards. You have to compete to get into the program, and then you compete against the high academic standards of a four-year university to remain in the program and to graduate. Uh, competition is good. It's the hallmark of military flight training and, and other very successful flight training programs around the world. Additionally, our program is extensively peer-reviewed. There are about 30 major universities that band together under an organization called the Aviation Accreditation Board International, and we willingly submit ourselves to peer review of our program that increases the strength of our program and it spreads the good word and a collegial atmosphere to other institutions so all the boats rise on the tide at the same time. Additionally, we think a program that teaches pilots to fly in the regionals and in the majors should be stable financially. In our area alone, uh, we've had three flight training providers uh, go bankrupt or go out of business in the last six months, uh, two, in fact, in the last three months, most with significant loss of money to the individual and a loss of training. Um, we think it's important that students that put down a, a sizable amount of money, maybe sixty or $70,000, there's, a, uh, there's an uh, expectation that they will graduate. 
again, in, at, in the collegiate aviation training environment, that expectation is that you have an opportunity to compete against the standard to graduate. And we think that is a much better way of doing business than simply cash for training. A successful aviation training program like ours has a strong academic quotient. In the first one and one half years of the four-year degree, our students complete all the academic work associated with the FA required commercial pilot certificate. And that is the certificate required uh, to become a regional airline pilot. However, the next two and a half years in a Bachelor of Science degree program heavy on math and physics, our students essentially get the same education that a senior 747 captain has, uh, while certainly not their experience, uh, but they get that same education in jet engine systems, in weather, icing, autopilot usage, all those various uh, functions. Uh, we think it's very important that they be fully prepared to fly jet aircraft. Additionally, the flight and training and simulation program that supports their training should be a modern one. We have chosen at Embry-Riddle to follow Part 142 of the Code of Federal Regula Regulation. We're the only major university and one of the few general aviation training programs that trains under Part 142, which is essentially the way the airlines train. After the downturn in our business, uh, after 9-11 in 2003, our university made a huge investment in technology, almost $10 million in simulators and about $2 million in automatic dependent surveillance broadcast equipment so that our students would be on the cutting edge of aviation training. By being in part 142, we do about 35% of our training in those simulators where we can train for those emergencies in real time. And we think even though it subjects us to greater FA scrutiny, it is the way to train. It's what we should be doing. Now I would also speak for the, in my remaining couple seconds here, for the young men and women that I work with all the time. They would ask that at the completion of this rigorous program that they could make a living wage. Uh, I think the combination of the low wage and the commuting situation we have right now is very challenging. If you're a senior captain and can have a foam in Florida where I, I live, it's a really good thing. But if you're a young person making $22,000 a year, it is a lot of expense. In closing, I would say uh, Embry-Riddle shares the, the grief in this tragedy. Uh, we have a young man named Joseph, or had a young man named Joseph Cefaletto. Joseph was a pilot for Colgan. He was deadheading in the back of the aircraft, and he was a graduate of our Prescott program. An outstanding young man, outstanding young pilot, and we grieve for all the victims of the Buffalo crash because the Amber Riddle community grieves as well. We thank you for your uh, attention and I stand ready for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ayers. Uh, Captain Prater, um, in your written testimony, you talk about uh, the fatigue cushion that was once provided uh, and was negotiated as a part of the work rules has virtually been eliminated by the airlines. Uh, tell us why that is. Uh, Chairman Costello, uh, thank you. The one of uh, Captain Babbitt's predecessors, I believe it was Admiral Ingen, once said, we don't have to change the flight time, duty time, FARs, because the ALPA contracts are more conservative. They're safer than that. I would say, through the processes of bankruptcy, we have lost many of the work rules that used to make our contracts safer. They were above the FARs. I'll give you uh, some concrete evidence. As a new airline pilot back in the late 70s, early 80s, I would fly approximately and be paid for 75 to 79 hours a month. That took in the credit time so that if my duty day was 15 hours long, I was not paid or credited with just the three hours that I actually flew. I was given a credit for, say, five hours. That limited me to how many days I worked. After bankruptcy at Continental in 83, we went to basic FAR minimums. It has greatly increased the workloads of pilots. What we have seen in the last round of bankruptcies following 9-11 is that has spread to all corners of the industry. The regional industry was created to make up for the loss of the national industry. We lost all the airlines like Ozark and North Central those airlines were career pilot jobs. They had career contracts. They had pension plans, if you can imagine that. Now, those are all gone. They've been replaced because the major carriers are looking for a cheaper way to do business. 
They created the regional industry, and they are at the very minimums of pay, and they fly right up to the maximum FARs, and we have been unable to change that through collective bargaining. Hopefully, we'll be able to change that uh, so that we can make it a better job and uh, make it a more stable career. Thank you. So the bottom line is it's all about money. Not at all. I like to go home every night after my trip. I want to get home. Over half of the founders of the Airline Pilots Association were pilots in the 30s died in airplane crashes. Our foundation as a union is based upon professional standards. It's based upon increasing those safety standards. We dedicate ourselves to that, and we charge our members a very high rate to be part of that. I think maybe you may have misunderstood my, my question and, and, or my comment, and it's all about money where the airlines are concerned as far as cutting back on uh, the work rules uh, relative to fatigue cushion and a number of other things. The airlines, you know, we're actually proud to work for our airlines. We want to do a good job. They're under tremendous uh, competitive pressures. They've gotten too low. The competition has led us to look for it every cut in every corner, and I believe that is cutting into the fabric of the safety uh, levels that we see. Um, Captain Prater, how does your, uh, you, you heard uh, Mr. May talk about a centralized pilot record system, uh, a database, uh, and others have uh, mentioned that as well. How does uh, ALPA feel about a centralized uh, database? Well, obviously we're much more concerned about the performance day in and day out. Um, as Captain Babbitt said, airline pilots are tested continually. There is a lot of information available to our employers or prospective employers about uh, our performance. But just like ours in a logbook, it's what you do today and you have to prove yourself day in and day out. Whether a, uh, a young pilot at Embry-Riddle failed a maneuver on his commercial tests, such as turns about a point or spiraling maneuvers, and had to retake that provision. That is not uh, that important to an airline. Now, trend analysis, how many failures, multiple failures on the same maneuver, that would raise the awareness. But there are no perfect pilots. I don't represent any. I haven't been one. We learn by making mistakes. We're a safe airline, by f we're a safe airline crew because we got a first officer that's trained to that same level and traps my mistake and catches it. That's the foundation of airline safety in the cockpit. Mr. Morgan, um, you state that Colgan recently increased the minimum uh, flight uh, experience requirements for new pilots and uh, captain upgrade candidates. Um, tell us what the old standard was, what the new standard is. The new standard was implemented in October last year, and that standard is 1,000 hours for minimum time. The standard prior to that was a 600 hours total time and 100 hours of multi-engine time. And why did you find it necessary to increase the minimum standards? We didn't necessarily find it a necessity to increase the time, but uh, certainly with um, the market supply of pilots that's on, out there today, you can go to a higher standard, although we do feel that as we moved into a larger aircraft, more experience was necessary to do. The... Um you indicate also, uh, let's talk a little bit about the stick pusher training. Uh, Colgan required that uh, in an academic sense, but not in a simulator. Is that that's, correct? That's correct, sir. And, and why is that? Well, the, the approach to training for the stalls has been uh, long done this way in the industry, but it's more of the recognition and recovery from a stall rather than going full to the stick pusher. Um, this was something that's termed for a long time, I believe, a negative training. We wanted to take a positive training step that said, we're going to teach you how to recognize that you're approaching a stall. When you reach a stall, you'll recover from the stall. You should never reach a point where the stick shaker or stick pusher gets activated. And therefore, we felt that it was appropriate to make you aware that the stick pusher was there, but not to train you because you should never, ever see it. Mr. Loftus, would you like to comment? Yeah, I think that's a big mistake to make. I, I can't see their logic behind why you wouldn't demonstrate at least the stick pusher. It takes about two minutes to do that in the simulator, to do it properly, to, to avail the students to, to at least to be aware of what's going to happen. If anybody's ever been in a simulator and experienced that condition, yeah, it's like a three-alarm fire. 
and to be able to think and to make the right call outs and make it, it, it it's a, it's a it, I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do it. Um, Mr. Morgan, uh, through, uh, as a result of the NTSB uh, three-day hearings, it was revealed that Captain Renslow had four uh, disapprovals due to uh, failed check rides during his career. Three occurred before he was hired by Colgan uh, and included failed check rides for his private pilot instrument, his commercial pilot, and his commercial multi-engine certificate. What did what did you know at the time? What did Colgan know at the time as far as Captain uh, Renslow's uh, record when he was uh, uh, hired and then promoted from first officer to, to a captain? At the time, sir, what we knew was what we were, were able to retrieve through the PREA system and what Mr. Renslow provided to us on his application. Uh, we used a five-year uh, background check as afforded under PREA. Uh, we did not have anything that was reported by Mr. Renslow as having any previous failures. The failures that he had achieved or had uh, experienced while he was with Colgan, each of those we followed the process to remove him from flying until he successfully completed that uh, check and moved on up to the next level, as any other pilot would do when they fail the check. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Petrak. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank all of you for your testimony. <clears throat> I I have a lot of questions in a little time, so I'll do my best to touch on a few uh, highlights, uh, and especially Mr. Loftus, uh, it's, you bring a concern and knowledge to this, and that's hopefully going to be very helpful to, to us as we go forward. In your testimony, you emphasized, uh, as I understood it, two things really, the importance of experience and of training, and really it, I guess being a pilot is uh, there's a kind of a, uh, a quite you, you learn tricks of the trade in effect by working with people who've had experience and pass that down as it happens in many many aspects you didn't really talk about uh, uh, fatigue I know that's an issue in transportation broadly uh, yeah. people driving whether it's a any 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 vehicle and trying to make sure that that doesn't overwhelm uh, safety. Uh, I know the investigation is still going forward, uh, but uh, that, did, do you feel that that was a problem, or was really more training? Um, I, I addressed it in my my uh, written statement a little bit, um, but yeah, I do think it's a common problem. Uh, maybe not with the more experienced pilots; they know how to manage. They've they've you know been there doing it 20 years, so they they've learned to. Uh, to manage their time. They're making more money too and they can afford to buy a crash pad or a hotel room or a day room to get their rest from when they come in and commute. But many times, um, many times I've flown, you know, repeated hours, you know, my hours at Express, I mean, eight, ten legs a day and then have to fly part 91 at night to back to a maintenance base. Um, you know, it's inherently very dangerous. Um, these things need to be addressed. Um, I think that the community aspect uh, needs to be addressed outside the, the uh, bargaining area. I think that's where we, it took us uh, uh, two tries at, in the contract, in contract 97, they subsequently got it at Connell Express, a commuter policy, an effective commuter policy, which allows uh, for, for pilots to, to get into the base, but it also gives the company some protections too, you know, some heads up and things. And I think that that, that would be a good, uh, commuting's gonna stay around forever. Pilots are gonna live where they wanna live. They're gonna work where they work and, you know, follow the equipment they want to by base by base. But it, I think an effective commuter policy that works both for the airline and the pilots would be effective in this, uh, in this avenue, this set of regulations. I think that no matter what you're going to do, people are still going to live where they want to live. Uh, I think more, a uh, better way to, to, to attempt to, to solve the problem would be a commuter policy outside the bargaining area. The, uh, the whole pl plane was lost, the passengers and the crew. They clearly had an interest in trying to operate the plane safely. They lost their lives as well. Right. Which may, 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 I'm not an expert, but it makes me think that training and preparation and uh, are, are absolutely key because the person has every desire to react well, I, correctly. One of my favorite sayings was that there was only one person's life that was more important on that aircraft than the passengers, and that was mine. I wanted to be around at the end of the day. No, I, I think that every pilot has that feeling as well. 
Uh, one other area I wonder if I could just touch on, and it's alluded to a, quite a bit in the testimony, and that's the relationship between the major airlines and the commuter airlines, and whether th there's an adequate, uh, adequate provisions for the majors to supervise and ensure the safety of, of, the, of the feeder airlines. And I wonder, Mr. Cohen, if you could address, address that. Turn your microphone on. Excuse me. There's a number of these programs, all the programs that you've heard about today, ASAP, BOQA, LOSA, those are shared extensively as well at, throughout the regional industry as well. The, the relationship between these carriers that um, we have regular meetings with all the mainline people, both under the both directly and under the umbrella of the associations through the ATA and the RAA. So there's quite an extensive uh, uh, interrelationship. It's one of the uh, reasons why we're such enthusiastic supporters of uh, the call to action next week, that we can actually, you know, make this even, uh, institutionalize this even more. We're strong supporters of it. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Captain uh, Prater, I'd just uh, like to uh, give you some quotes from <clears throat> some of your predecessors testifying before here, uh, this committee uh, from ALPA, uh, Dwayne, uh, Mr. Worth. Uh, pilots have been dis disciplined, including terminated, for calling in fatigued. They have been called in to see the chief pilot which is, again, a varied response depending upon the nature of the airline, nature of the management team, and whether they have the benefit of a union contract. So clearly what we need is a federal regulation to make that a non-question of compliance. Uh, then we had, uh, that was 1999. Uh, then, of course, we had the current FAA administrator, uh, Captain Babbitt, uh, the intimidation factor is clearly there. I could parade a string of witnesses in here that would shock you. There is no private whistleblower protection. The pilots are intimidated. What quite often will happen is pilots who resist that, and again, I can present hard copy where a pilot is terminated. We use the grievance machinery and defend him in maybe eight or ten months. A neutral will give him his job back. In the meantime, who paid him? I can assure you that is a lesson to the pilots. They are intimidated by the carrier. Does this still go on? Yes, absolutely. We still have managements that believe that they can push pilots by threatening them because the flight must go on. The trip must go on or we don't get paid. I'm saying the airlines, some airlines, continue the bad old practices that uh, were first created in, in the uh, Lorenzo era in my time, maybe the Cord area era uh, in earlier times. They continue to push pilots. They threaten them with terminations, um, and we see it. We then win the grievances, and they refuse to reinstate pilots. So when we look under the covers starting next week with Captain Babbitt, I will parade those people in here where we're still seeing those practices. I'll name names to Captain Babbitt at that time and let them deal with it. I believe that the major airline that sells the ticket must ensure those practices do not exist within any of the carriers that they use, whether they own them or whether they outsource them to other contract carriers. But those practices are alive and well, sir. Uh, what would uh, the representative of the Regional Transport Association say in response to that? Do you deny, is he, is he lying, making it up? I, I would not, if, if those kind of practices exist, they shouldn't exist. Okay, so uh, we've been hearing this <clears throat> for 17 years. Uh, probably I, there's dates before that on this committee that I don't recall. I've just gone back to review transcripts in 92. Um, <clears throat> back then, uh, the, at least you're a little more uh, in line here, but I, the RTA representative back then just gave me the example of, well, what if you're in Bend, Oregon? And the pilot says he's too tired to fly. And I said, well, great, I'll take the bus back over to the valley with him. 
you know, I don't want to fly if he doesn't want to fly. Uh, the point is, everybody, you, Mr. Morgan, and the ATA all say, oh, well, it's the pilot's call. It's the pilot's call. But we're hearing from Captain Bray, it's not the pilot's call if he or she values their job in some of these organizations. Uh, we've got to root this out. I mean, we just have to root this out. I mean, I can't believe I've been, you know, I mean, been hearing this for 17 years, and we've heard it from the current head of the FAA 17 years ago, and it's still going on. We have here uh, a, a blind uh, study, uh, Dr. John Caldwell, fatigue management consultant for the uh, Air Force and Army. His research found that 80% of regional pilots surveyed, they had nodded off during a flight and that scheduling factors such as multiple takeoffs and landings every day were top contributors to operational fatigue. I mean, do we, do, do you acknowledge we got a problem here? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. DeFazio, uh, issues of fatigue is right at the top of the list of human factors that we have said that we, we need, as Mr. May pointed out, we need to be looking at all of these issues. And because it is time to address all of these issues in a holistic way. Okay. I mean, my key point over all the years has been, and I made it to the earlier panel, if we adopt a standard that everybody has to follow that prevents these problems, then nobody's at a competitive disadvantage, and you don't have to worry about that one bad actor who's trying to drag down everybody, hey, I can provide a cheaper flight. How can you do that? Well, my pilots are tired. They're not as well trained. My planes aren't as well maintained. You know, the FAA doesn't really uh, impose those things on us. We've got to get rid of that. I mean, that, that's got to go. And then, we, you know, the, if we're assuring people of safety, then that stuff's got to go, and nobody's going to be at a disadvantage. Everybody starts in the same place. And I would hope that the associations would support robust changes that will bring about uh, an end to these practices. Mr. May. Uh, Congressman, I think uh, from the ATA perspective, we absolutely do. Uh, we have said in the past, I mean, uh, Dwayne Worth and John Prater and uh, Randy Babbitt have vastly more experience in this industry than I do, so I'm not going to sit here and try and, and suggest that they're wrong. But I think that there is now a forum uh, run by one of the three, as a matter of fact, uh, that we'll all be participating in next week. I'm, I'm sure that the issue of fatigue, flight and duty time, it needs to come up and should come up. I think the issues of commuting and the impact that has on readiness I think the, uh, the issue of professionalism of pilots uh, needs to come up. All of these issues need to be addressed. They need to be laid on the table. There ought not to be any restrictions as to what subjects are there. And if Captain Prater has a specific evidence of uh, pilot pushing uh, by carriers, I, I think we would welcome seeing that put on the table. Okay. You're going to do that, Captain Prater? I'd be more than happy to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks the gentleman and now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Michael. Thank you. I'm pleased to see uh, Dr. Ayers here from uh, Emory-Riddle, uh, which happens to be located in my uh, congressional district. Uh, it is without question the finest aeronautical institute uh, university, not only in the United States but the world. Uh, everywhere I go, I'm proud to meet uh, graduates in every field of the uh, aviation industry who are absolutely outstanding. I venture to say, and you don't have to respond to this too, that very few of your graduates are involved in some of these issues because uh, I've never seen anything but, again, the highest stand standards uh, performed by those uh, graduates uh, who are first come so dedicated and then are so professional. Uh, I'm going to ask the staff, my staff to look at uh, the background of some of these uh, flights where we have had uh, fatalities, just out of curiosity, to see the difference in training. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment, Dr. Ayers. I, I certainly would. We uh, to expand upon my statement a little bit. Uh, we think that it's not how many hours the pilot has in their logbook. But what was done, what was examined, what was measured, what was trained in that hour. And we really stand ready as a university with a deep research background uh, to uh, provide some science to some of this discussion so we can see what it really does take. We think what we've come to, and on the second page of my prepared marks, there's data that shows that our pilots 
even with fairly low hours in the 500 hour range, score in the same area where military pilots do. We're very proud to be in that group. That's a very high echelon of aviation expertise. Mm -hmm. So we do think that how we train makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Cohen and uh, Mr. Prater, uh, do you favor uh, opening performance records and training certification uh, to, the, to, again, the employers uh, without restriction? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Micah, absolutely. It's the number one thing that, that, that we have Thank proposed. You. How about you, Mr. Prater? I believe the full background uh, should be available, but that uh, raises another level, sir, and that means uh, that those records have to be kept in some type of standardized basis so that we're comparing apples with apples. Very good. Mr. May, if I had a, a pound of butter and I spread it over uh, 10 loaves of bread, uh, I the would The answer have, is 14. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then if I had a pound of bre butter and I spread it, spread it over 20 loaves of bread, what would happen with the second uh, 20 loaves of bread? Is, Your is, answer is, is they get less butter. Well, I, I think that is the answer that's expected. Uh, I'm not sure that's uh, well, what that I is the do, case what I, with aviation safety. Well, what I want to do is take the number of inspectors, and I, I looked at the administration's proposal. There's a 4.4 percent increase uh, in safety uh, uh, operations, uh, but uh, we're also mandating from co uh, Congress uh, some inspections on. A, uh, for foreign repair stations that uh, we've already have being done at the same standard. So we're taking personnel to do what's done uh, uh, existing standards and, uh, and using those personnel uh, where we don't need them. Uh, wouldn't you think it would be better served that we spread that butter where we need the coverage? I, I think that makes ultimately good sense, uh, Mr. Micah, but I it, it raises an interesting uh, point. We've talked about one level of safety here. I, I, think, I think on paper we have one level of safety. Certainly it's called FAR 121. Mm -hmm. And we all, whether it's a regional airline, commuter airline, uh, mainline carrier, have to live up to the principles and standards of FAR 121. The question is whether or not it is being aggressively enforced, audited, et cetera. Right. And I think but that's, that's where we're going to take on. Spreading the butter thinner that is, uh, and doing things we don't need to do. Thank you. May Mr. I have one moment? No, no uh, because I'm running out of time. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Costello holds me right to the. Well, he gives me a little bit of leeway as the ranking member. But uh, um, I, I just want to get a question on the record about. The way compensation is determined for regional carriers. Now, I'm told it's a negotiation between, I guess, the, the union or the pilot representatives and uh, the uh, air carrier. Is that the way it's done, uh, Mr. Cohen? I, I, honestly, I don't know the answer to my question, Mr. Brady. I've been told uh, is, is that it? there's a preliminary. Uh, wage level set, and then is there? It, it's, could it's, you explain to the committee how that's done? Because I've heard a lot about wages, and the airlines are doing the, the regionals are doing this on the cheap, and pilots are are getting paid adequate compensation, or co-pilots are getting uh, far less than they should, and pilots get a certain range. How is that? How is that compensation determined? At, at all, but. Uh, one of our carriers, uh, they, every one of the agreements for the uh, crew members is collectively bargained to the federal. So that is a determination between, again, the, the pilots' representatives and the airlines. And then the, the difference between the levels, uh, say, for a captain or uh, the, the primary pilot and the co pilot or a lesser position, is that? Also part of that negotiation? Also all, all covered under the collective bargaining agreement. So that it's agreed on by the union or the representative and the airline. Correct. Thank you. The uh, chair thanks you, Mr. Micah. And um, let me um, thank uh, all of our witnesses uh, for um, 
being here to testify today, uh, in particular um, you, Mr. Loftus, on behalf of the families. Um, I can assure you and the family members who are with us and those who could not uh, be with us today that uh, the subcommittee is not going to let this issue slip away, that we are going to work, uh, we're, we're looking forward as, as all of you are, to the uh, meeting on Monday with the uh, Department of Transportation and the FAA Administrator to see what comes out of that meeting, but it's clear, at least to me, I can't speak for other members of the subcommittee, that uh, we can no longer uh, rely on recommendations by the FAA, that some standards are going to have to be changed, and uh, uh, I think we need to look at uh, the relationship between the major carriers and the, uh, the regional airlines, and I think we need to take a look at uh, the training to find out if, in fact, uh, For instance, some of the issues that we talked to uh, or talked about today should be incorporated as mandatory training as opposed to leaving it up to the airlines uh, uh, to their discretion. Uh, obviously, fatigue is a major factor. As Captain Prater said, this is not the first time that he has talked about the issue before the subcommittee. Uh, we've heard others, not only uh, pilots, but uh, air traffic controllers and others within the system talk about uh, their concern. We've heard testimony from the Inspector General. We've heard testimony from the GAO on uh, the issue of fatigue. Uh, I think we need to look at uh, pilot records and to determine if we need a data bank uh, uh, and how far uh, those records, how far we can go back uh, so that uh, all of the airlines have access uh, when they are uh, hiring uh, a new uh, first officer, a new pilot, uh, to know what uh, that person's record is, as well as uh, all of the NTSB's recommendations. I at least feel at this point that um, with the new administrator, uh, given his background and his experience as a pilot and with ALPA, uh, that he understands the importance of uh, when the NTSB makes a recommendation, uh, that uh, he is going to implement a system uh, to review those recommendations, figure out uh, either one, implement them, two, modify them or three, uh, reject them and give a solid reason for rejecting them uh, and to get reports to us and to the Congress on these issues. So again, we uh, thank all of you for being here today to offer your testimony. Um, and uh, let me just say that, uh, again, we are going to do everything we can to uh, continue to focus as we did with the past administration, with this administration, uh, to do our follow our responsibility to uh, provide the oversight so that the FAA and others in the system are doing what they need to do to continue to have the safest aviation system in the world. With that, I would ask uh, the ranking member, Mr. Petri, if he has any final thoughts or comments. No, we join you in the determination to stick with this. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Again, thank you, and that uh, concludes the uh, hearing today, and the subcommittee stands adjourned.